Father, it is amazing to sing those words and to know that they are true. That you who spoke all things into existence, you who created everything, Father, that you who have existed from eternity past and will always be and who is sovereign over all things in control of everything, who is everywhere, loves us. And Father, that is nothing short of amazing. You know each and every one of us <laughs> perfectly. All seven point whatever billion people on the face of this planet, Father, there's not one random molecule in the entire cosmos that you are not over and you are holding all things together and yet you who are that awesome love us. God, such a truth, such a reality should give us great, great comfort great confidence, not in ourselves, but in you, should give us that strength that we need, Father, to go through each day knowing that you are with us, that you are for us, that nothing can separate us from your love, that while we may or may not be loved by other people, Father, that you love us. And God, that is incredible. We praise you and we thank you. And Father, I thank you for your word. And I ask and pray that you would speak to us so that we as a church today might continue to grow in our understanding of, of who you've called us to be, what you've called us to do, and what will be required for us to stand in the years to come. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's good to see you today. A uh, quick thing, and we're going to hopefully try to set the table. We're going to be looking at today, we're continuing our series on those things that are very important for the church, for church health, for moving forward, that vision for the church. And today we're going to be taking a look at how things should function in the life of a church. Question, following instructions, important or not important? important. Some of you are still thinking about it. <laughs> kind of important. Okay, as a young kid, one of my earliest memories of the whole idea, I used to have, well, I'm talking elementary school, like one of my early elementary school age memories. It was a, a big deal. I wanted to be the first one to turn my paper in, you know? Okay, so I'm blasting through as a math class. I am blasting through it because there were some other kids in the class that there's like a little group of this little tribe that you're kind of competing with each other, you know? You're not saying it, but yeah, I'll be the first one to go in there and turn the paper upside down. That's the way you used to do it back in the day. And so I am crushing it. Slap that bad boy down and I sit down. I was pretty proud of myself. Problem, okay? The whole thing, the entire little math quiz, it was a quiz, fortunately, Maybe 20 questions or whatever. I can still see the little worksheet. It had addition and subtraction. I didn't notice. I added everything. <laughs> First one to turn in. Let's just say I had some different answers than other people did on a good portion of them. And I was pretty proud. And it was like, oh. And the teacher actually laughed. I can still see her doing that. And she was like, I can tell you didn't look at the instructions. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I was really embarrassed. And so she, she actually gave me a few more points more, which, you know, which was pretty nice because but she said, next time, well, next time I was like really, that kind of scarred me. I was really slow. Following instructions, any of you guys ever put together? Because ladies were very good about not doing this. Any guys ever look at something you're putting together and think, you see the instructions, you'll look it over and go, pfft. Got it. Don't need it. Exactly, right? <laughs> I've got something in my garage that's missing a few pieces, but it's together. I don't know what those pieces are for. It doesn't work properly, but I didn't read the instructions. I read them. Well, I glanced at them and thought, that's easy. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. They are extra. Following instructions is important. We can agree. I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting... It's going to be a gotcha kind of a thing. Not in a mean way, okay? Because one of the things we're going to look at today is actually one of the sources of, of, of so many church members all over America, sources of frustration. I don't want the church to be done. Da, 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 da. Well, we've not been following instructions for a long, 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 long time when it comes to how the church is to function. We've kind of not done that. I had a very humbling thing. 
And just so you'll know, and this actually fits, your, your body ideally should be one integrated unit when you're exercising and when you move around. And I've had a very humbling experience, but it's been a pretty cool thing too. I'm pretty excited about it. I'm sore all the time, which is like, I love that. For years and years and years and years and years, all the fun lifting weights, so on and so forth, which I've always enjoyed. Um, about six years ago, they told me to stop doing certain things. They said, well, you're back because I only have one disc. The last time I have one disc that's not either herniated or, or bulged and or whatever, like, it's just like, it's just jacked up. My back is jacked up, right? So about six years ago, they said, no more squats, no more deadlifts, no more this, that, and the other. And so basically all you can do, if you're going to do anything in your legs, you can do some leg extensions and you can do some leg curls and calf raises, but that's it. Now what was interesting was, was that in doing that, what I did not know is that I finally went to a different, uh, this is what other spinal doctor told me. Stop doing all those things. My back kept getting, why did my back hurt worse and worse and worse? And it's like, well, guess you're getting old. It's like, no, I'm still exercising. I'm still going to the gym, but I'm working around all these other things, but I'm not doing certain things. And so I go back to the, the doc who's the Spurs doc. And he said, I'm going to send you to PT. And I got someone who's going to get you squared away. And so they went in and she said the first thing was, was like, okay, for six years, you've not been doing, you know, we actually, you should be doing those things, the squats and everything else. She goes, so the whole posterior chain, we're going to work on that and we're going to work on it and work on it because they analyze my walk, how I stand. I mean, it was a whole, and it's like, oh, you just compensate when you're hurting, right? And so what she said was, we're going to build up those areas. You actually should have been working on those areas. But the problem is, is that almost everybody who does these exercises does them wrong. She said, and that's including the professional, she goes, even the professional athletes that come in here, we have to retrain them. How do you do it right? Most people do squats and deadlifts absolutely with the wrong form. And I was raised in the very beginning of the ages of weightlifting when you just, you kind of had a close to a form, but the main point was just to yank as much pounds as you could, okay? So years of that, of not doing things correctly, made, uh, caused a physical toll, okay? Caused a big physical toll. And so here's what they had me do. She said, we're going to, they've been, I have all these at home things. So I go to PT twice a week and then I have all these things I do at home. And so I am continually walking around like, ah, ah, and it feels great. But she said, okay, I got to finally, I have to earn the right to get back to a bar. So you got to earn the right. Form has got to be perfect. I was like, okay, all right. So they had me stand. It was the most humiliating thing. Because mind you, I've been lifting weights since the late 1800s. I mean, for, forever. <laughs> I think I know how things should be done. I know how you do squats. I know how you do deadlifts. So she says, I want you to I want to stand up. I want you to look at her without any weight or whatever you're going to do in basic form. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I know you don't do this. And so I start and I, I stop. I'm like, what did I do wrong? Your chest is going to be back. And she's telling me to hold my... So now, I'm, now she's got me standing in a certain way, and I get ready to move again. She'll stop. I'm like, what, what am I doing? What is, she goes, no, drive, drive. Drive out here. Drive your hip. Your feet are, your feet are firm. You're planted. A little bit short. Drive out here. I'm like, okay, okay. So I'm thinking chest. And then I'm going to get ready to go a little bit lower. And she says, stop. And I'm like, dang it. She's like, she's she doing this so for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, all I mean, it was like wax on, wax off, wax on. I was like, you're killing me. And so finally I get the form correctly. And she's like, okay, this is body weight stuff. And every time I deviated from anything, stop. She's like, perfect form, perfect form. We're going to get perfect form, perfect form. And so I was like, okay. She goes, now we'll do deadlifts. And I thought, well, this is going to be a little bit easier. And I thought, this is pretty cool. There's no bar. So they set this, and this was like very humiliating. Okay. They set this box up in front of me. And you know what a kettlebell is? Okay. Now, back in the day, I could squat a pretty heavy amount, but my, my form wasn't correct. I could deadlift a lot, but the form wasn't right. 10-pound kettlebell on top of a little thing right here. She says, we're going to start with this. And I thought, okay, people are in the room, right, you know, standing there. She's like, okay, get my, she got my form, gets me all lined up. She says, you're going to bend over and you're going to just lift this weight up. I'm like, okay, whatever. I can pick the weight up and go, eh, whatever. So I start, and what do you think she does? As soon as I start, stop. I was like, dad, gum it. I finally got to the point where I actually touched the top of the kettlebell, and I'm really excited. No, I'm serious. I was excited. I was like, uh huh, uh huh. Who's in charge now? Stop. I was like, mm. So when I finally do grab the kettlebell, I'm thinking, okay, this is it. 
this is ten pages. Pick it up. So I start, to, I start to exact. I'm very careful. I'm going really, really slow, thinking maybe, maybe the whole slow thing will really show her how much I'm paying attention. Stop. Put it down. Put it down. Put it down. It's like. Dang it. And so at the end of the one, it's all said and done, literally on those two exercises, 40 minutes of nothing but like wax on, wax on, stop, 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 stop. No, 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 no. And she said, we will earn the right until we put you on that bar over there. But then you're going to do it. And once that whole posterior chain is strengthened up, it's going to help your back problems. It's going to help them profoundly because you're walking incorrectly. You're standing incorrectly. She said, everything about it, you have adjusted over the years. And she goes, and those are the very things that will take away your back pain. So if you've got lower back pain because your back is jacked up, go to, uh, they're great people. Okay. But yeah, the whole thing is frustrating. You might say, well, what does it have to do with us? The whole body is one, should be one functional unit. When one part is not functioning correctly, when other parts are neglected, the whole body suffers. Does that make sense? And if you don't follow instructions, if you just think, well, the whole point is just to get the dadgum weight up, and you're just kind of ignoring your form, it's close, but you know, whatever, it causes problems. Well, in the church, again, we've kind of been doing things the way we think we should for years and years and years and years and years. And now we have a church in America that is either bloated or is weak and it's not able to stand firmly with what is coming ahead because we're used to doing certain things and having certain expectations in the church that are unbiblical are nowhere found in terms of the instructions, so to speak. Here's how church works. And the quickest example of that would be that church over the years turned into a consuming spectator event in which this is what church is and that's it. And the idea of serving and the idea of investing, the idea of being discipled, the idea of, of, uh, of digging deep into theology, the idea of how a church should function was thrown out the window. We just needed to get that weight up and that weight, quote unquote, was as many people as we possibly could. How many can we get in? Moving forward, we've got, how about, how about we do this? How about we look at God's word and we do things his way? Let's try that. Let's try that, okay? It's a novel idea. It's kind of wax on, wax off, because a lot of you have heard this text before. We've all heard it. And I would guess if you grew up in the church, if you grew up in the church, you've heard this. But we don't do it for some reason. It's kind of like me saying, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. Let me lift up the weight. Let me just do what I want to do. No. Today we're going to look at how we organize for ministry and the expectation that the Lord has of his children. It's a quick overview. You can turn to the book of Ephesians. Later on in Ephesians uh, 5, 23b, Paul affirms what we all know, that Christ is the head of the church. This is the first thing where the church in America struggled. It's not a personality. It's not a board. Jesus is the head of the church. Okay, wait, let's try that. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, is the head of the church. It's his church. Okay, and good night, man. If we can't, that's point number one. We, can, we should stop there if we haven't got that. Jesus is head of the church. It's his. I am not free to create what I want to create in my own flesh. Here's what I think church should be. Nor are you. Nor are we. It's his church. It's his bride. We are his bride. Everything is his. So Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he has been explaining how Jesus is sovereignly gives gifts to his church. Each one of you who has been born again, all of you who are born again in Christ have been given spiritual gifts, and you are given those gifts for a reason. Gifts are not the same as talents, okay? Gifts are not the same as talents. Say that out loud with me. God gave you spiritual gifts for a reason, and he expects you to use those spiritual gifts and to not let them sit there and just atrophy, as a muscle would do when it's neglected. 
He goes on to describe because Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, because he defeated Satan's sin and death, because he has all authority over all things, because he is the head of the church, Ephesians 4, 11 through 6, uh, 16. And he gave the apostles, he gives gifts, he gives offices, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way in to him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Say that with me. When each part is working properly. Hello parts. <laughs> Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Jesus gives spiritual gifts as he pleases for the growth, for the building up of his church. You'll notice there's an actual process here. He gives various gifts and ministries to individuals for the purpose of equipping, the second part where we get things wrong, equipping the body to minister. He gave apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers. Let's look at that real quickly, okay? Apostles in this context refers to the actual 12, okay, the actual apostles, particularly the 12 who had seen the risen Christ who were sent by him. And Paul was numbered amongst those who saw the risen Christ because of his Damascus road experiences. The apostles were the missionaries who were sent by Christ. They had three specific main functions. First, they were to lay the foundations for the church. Ephesians 5, or 2 rather. Ephesians 2.20. They were to lay the foundation for the church. 2. They were to receive and to declare God's and write God's word. Yes, Ephesians 3, Acts chapter 11, and Acts chapter 21. Third, they were to give confirmation of that word of God through signs and wonders and miracles. The apostles were, that's in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. So the apostles were sent by Christ. They had a very distinct role in the building of the church. They had a role. Second, he gave the prophets. Now, there's a lot of debate between cessationists and non-cessationists over the nature of this gift, and that is for another sermon. We were not going to, because we're going to focus on other things here. But in broad terms, we can speak of these as people who boldly proclaim the truth of God's words, speaking for God to his church. He gave others. He gave other gifts. He gave the evangelists. Evangelists are simply those who proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. They proclaim the gospel. They spoke to outsiders, but what's interesting is that they also were connected and preached to and in the local church. We need to continually hear the gospel. We need to grow as a people who are clear on the gospel and all the implications of the gospel, delighting and resting in all that Christ has done for us. I oh, don't hear the gospel all the time. Well, I go to church and they preach the gospel. Buck Parsons said this, if you get tired of hearing your pastor preach the gospel, it's because you probably have never actually heard the gospel. The gospel should bring great joy when you hear it and you understand it. It's like, this is what Christ has done for us. And that also gives you great strength and great rest in your soul. He gave the shepherds and teachers. Your version may say pastors and teachers or pastors, teachers. It's best understood as one office that of pastor, teachers, either shepherds under the great shepherd, Jesus, who were also called elders and bishops, Titus 1 and Timothy 3. And these are men who are teaching shepherds, leading and teaching the church. And all of these gifts and offices are given for this ministry for a purpose. And again, here's where we get it wrong. Verse 12, to equip the saints. Hello, saints to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, equipping the saints, training, 
uh, word equipping means training, restoring, um, restoring something, making something fit or complete. That's the meaning of the word. Leading Christians from sin to disobedience, uh, to obedience, rather, <laughs> sin to obedience. Uh, helping Christians grow into Christ-likeness, proclaiming the truth so that Christians are not deceived. Preaching, teaching, applying the word, and discipling are the primary means. And notice the purpose for equipping the saints, all who are born again, to equip the saints for the work of Yeah, see, it's all right. I'm too short. Thank you. It's that word that begins with an M and ends with a Y. Ministry. To equip the saints, all of you, for your ministry. Your ministry. Where we got it wrong in the culture, where we started building churches around personalities. We learned how to market pastors and worship leaders and programs. And we learned how to do things that would draw a crowd that was all. But the thing, the dirty little secret of that, for the most part, it was one subculture, uh, a large subculture, rather, that was just migrating from one place to the other. San Antonio, a very brief oral history. <laughs> there were some booming churches inside 410 back in the day. White flight took place out a little bit past 1604. Guess where a lot of churches went? Out to 1604. Guess where a lot of people went? Out to 1604. Then pretty soon the churches are all, first it was around the 1604-281 corridor. Back when you could drive through Bull Verde and it didn't take 12 hours to get through the town. Now you dread going through. If you've never, if you've never been, I have a fun field trip for you. But take the kids by all means, please. On a 5 o'clock on any day. Just hit 1604 and 281 and head north on Boulevardy and have fun. Let me know how that goes for you. You're going to enjoy that. Churches all of a sudden felt called to go out there. There was a joke in our association that there would be a number of people back in that time who would call in from out of the city like, yeah, the Lord just lit on my heart that I'm supposed to start a church at. And it was always, interestingly, along the growth corridor. Fascinating. But soon that became congested, and so people, they, they said, oh, we got to get out of here. So they started to move, and they moved a little bit along the 1604 East. So there's a whole line of churches now up there from I-35 to 281. Well, that got congested too. People abandoned. They moved out there. So then they started heading west, 1604 to 10. Guess what? Guess where there's a great vacuum in San Antonio? Inside 1604, inside 410. Christians abandoned it for the most part. That's tragic. That's horrible. That's terrible. That's not how, that's, that, that's because we, 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 and we have a whole lot of celebrity pastors in our town for our say. It's a really interesting thing. But that is not going, that's not the way you're, that's not the way the church is supposed to be built. It's, Jesus is the head of the church. You're not supposed to grow a church by being the most whatever. This is not how it works. And it will not work as we enter into this new period that we are entering into. Just a snapshot in talking with my wife about the questions that she gets to get asked in class. And this has been a fascinating year for her. Kids literally coming up to them. There's a spiritual hunger. But now, mind you, these are junior high kids. And she's going to share with you briefly next week a testimony of, of a few things. She can't use names. But question after question after question... This past week, why did Jesus die on the cross? What was that about? She has been asked about why Jesus died. Do you believe that there's a God? She has been, now, now you say, well, that's just, you kids are asking questions. That's really cool. Think with me. I saw all of this coming when I was on college campuses, okay, for 10 years. More and more people showing up that had zero framework for God. Who he is, who he, who's Jesus? None. So now if you've got an entire junior high, for the most part, not entire, but a lot of junior high students and their families, I don't know, Christianity is some other religion, just like Hinduism or whatever. It's a religion. If you want to have one, it's fine. What, where will that lead in 12 years? You're talking about an entire culture in which the church will be a museum filled with people ages 55 and up. We are so close to post-Christian Europe, it's not funny. 
why don't we do what the Lord says in terms of church? Because I think he knows what he's talking about. He used people in persecution doing things his way to shake an entire empire. They weren't relying on the cult of personality. They were relying on the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And everybody understood everybody has a part and a role to play. So let's do that. All right? The pastor or ministers or deacons or church leaders are not hired guns. Everyone is called to be a minister, and our primary roles are called to equip. And that's been one of my great joys this year. It's been a, a big shift. I've been able to spend more time with whether it be with staff or with deacons or with the greenhouse on Wednesday nights just trying to really focus more on equipping and discipling. And I'm looking forward to finding more venues to do that. Preaching and teaching is also a part of that too. Roger's going to be doing more of that too as we move forward. How can we equip you? How can we equip you to do the ministry God's called you to do? Because again, every born again believer is a minister. But there's more going on here. We're all saved to serve. We're all gifted to serve. But there's a lot more going on. And this is huge because the purposes of equipping go even further than just equipping to serve. So I'm, this is not, I don't have a gotcha thing where it's like afterwards, you'll please meet with the nominating committee. We're going to plug you in somewhere because we have a need in X, Y, and Z department. Now we do have needs. I want you to pray about those. Okay. This is, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you. So just I'll hang on to that. We're all saved to serve, but we are also, we see here, that we are to equip so that you can stand firm and run well. Notice what Paul says, that the equipping is for building up the body of Christ. This is building up both, it refers to numeric as well as uh, maturity. Numeric growth as well as a maturation. That is an important part of the equipping so that you can be mature, so that we might also reach more people, so that, the, again, it grows the way the Lord designed it. So his instructions is not mine, Okay. Verse 13, until, notice again, here we go again, the end vision, what is Christ's desire? Until we all attain the unity of the faith, to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now the unity of faith here refers to the content of our Christian teaching. What we believe and the truth matters. What we believe matters. The content of the gospel. Faith specifically here refers to the content of our faith, and yes, that means doctrine. For too long in American culture, people would say, oh, don't talk about doctrine, no doctrine but Jesus. And that's nonsensical when you think about it because today, if you ask 100 people, well, who's Jesus? You're going to get about 75 answers. No doctrine but Jesus sounds nice and warm and fuzzy, but for some people, Jesus is just some enlightened teacher. For some, he was a good moral teacher. For some, he was a, a spiritual being. For some, he was whatever, okay? No, theology and doctrine matter. And it's time we, the church, embrace that. Doctrine divides. No, doctrine unites. Timothy Keller said this, ironically, the insistence that doctrines do not matter is really a doctrine itself. So the idea of saying doctrine doesn't matter, that's a doctrine. Doctrine matters. What we believe matters. We need to know what the Word of God teaches. The knowledge of the Son of God refers here that comes to the knowledge that comes through walking with Christ in relationship with Him. And the context implies this knowledge comes from hearing the Word also, preaching the Word, hearing the Word preached and taught, reading the Word, praying, meditating on the Word, studying the Word with other believers. In short, it means spending time with God, walking with God. This is not passive religion. This is an active pursuit of knowing Christ. Another area where we in the church in America for far too long have gotten it wrong. We have made Christianity just about a passive thing that we receive or that we kind of talk about or that Jesus is an add-on or he's a part of my life or he's even a big part of my life. No, he is your life if you're his child. Okay? Let's, let's get back to that too. And he, he calls us to the maturity here in this passage refers to uh, believers becoming more and more like Jesus. Jesus is a standard of spiritual maturity, not someone else. That's another area where we get it wrong. We look at so-and-so or so-and-so and go, wow, they're really mature. I want to be like them. No, you want to be like Jesus. Let's make him our standard. Okay? 
This is what I meant by the fullness of Christ. This is the maturity that we need for many reasons. And Paul highlights those in verses 14 and following. And we see again, proof in our culture that we've not been doing things per our Lord's instructions. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In other words, God expects us to grow into uh, spiritual uh, adulthood so that we are not tossed around like we're in, the, like a, in a stormy sea, like little children by every little wind and wave of doctrine that comes along. And yet that's taking place all over America. You've got people who are pulling from all sorts of false teachers, plus orthodox teachers, plus whatever makes them feel good, and building their own hybrid faith. This is the standard. Okay? Let's get back to this. Let's come back to this. Let's measure what we hear against the word of God. Please do. You check it out yourself. When you check it out. Okay? I want you to read your Bible. So that we will not be misled by human coming, by false teachers, by, 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 by false doctrine. And again, that's being played out everywhere. And we wonder today, we see so many people, how many times have you heard this story? Wow, so-and-so was really active in church, and where are they now? They're doing what? My goodness, how they drift over there, how they get involved in that cult, how they get involved in that weird thing. Because we've I mean, neglected discipleship, we've neglected equipping, we've neglected theology, we've neglected doctrine, we've turned Christianity into a spectator sport. We can start there. Right? I mean, come on. And we've also told people, no, you don't have to feed yourself. Stay in the spiritual high chair. You've only been a Christian 25 years. No, you're not ready to eat yet. Let someone else spoon feed you once a week. That's all you need. People can't distinguish between truth and error or between right and almost right because we don't spend time in the Word, and that's because... We've not been doing things the way the Lord has instructed. You'll note that Christ expects us to grow up, to be mature, to serve, to know him, to know the truth, to distinguish truth from error. And so many of our churches are anemic because we are filled with, 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 with as a body with, with professing believers that, that we're not mature. <laughs> we haven't even taken, we don't know how to feed ourselves yet. Spurgeon had some pretty strong words for his day when this was happening in England as the downgrade began. Alas, much has been done, he said, of late to promote the production of dwarfish Christians. Poor sickly believers turn the church into a hospital rather than an army. Oh, to have a church built up with the deep godliness of people who know the Lord in their very hearts and who seek to follow the Lamb no matter the cost. Now, the church is always going to be a hospital to a degree because you're always, and I'm not, we will all go through seasons where we are wounded and where we are hurt, okay? Where we're limping, where we've been shot in battle, so to speak. But in America, again, where we've got it wrong, we have, the church is a hospital, always. If a church is always a hospital and everybody's always wounded and everybody's whatever, would you say that we've got some, uh, what kind of a God do we serve? Well, he saved me, and he put me in a hospital, and I just blessed my heart. How long have you been in the hospital? Ever since I became a Christian. In fact, people take care of me. We're like that person that's in the hospital. He, he keeps ringing the buzzer, you know, for the nurse to come. Hurry up. Want some more water? What do you need now? Want something to eat? What do you want now? Taco Bell. We don't give you Taco Bell in here. People don't like his food. And, like, and you get that in the church. Feed me. Feed me. Take care of me. da da bump, 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 bump. When the Lord was saying, you know what, my child, I love you. I, I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. I want to build you back up. I want to take care of those things that are broken. And then he does. And now he says, child of God, get up and walk. Oh, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay here. Beep, beep. I'm upset. Things are, I don't like beep, beep. Let's not do that. Okay. We're expected to grow into maturity, right? That's what Christ expects. Again, are you going to get wounded? Yes. Are you going to get hurt? Yes. I'm not denying that. I know that. But if that is the entirety of almost your Christian testimony, we've got, we've got to grow. Okay? We've got to grow. 
some folks are still hanging on to hurts from 20 whatever years ago. Or grudges from 20 odd years ago. You might say, no one is. No, I actually was in a church once and I learned that from people. Still mad at a pastor from 20 some odd years. It was multiple pastors since then. Yeah, what the pastor did was really, really wrong. I didn't talk about that man. It's like, man, sooner or later, you're going to need to let go. Trust God. Move forward. Be mature. Okay? That happened. It wasn't good. But Jesus Christ is greater. We see more of his desire for the church, verse 15 and following, whether he's speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. As opposed to spiritual infants who are continually consuming and who are easily deceived, we are to grow into a people who are mature, speaking the truth in love, so all become more and more like Jesus. This is an all of us responsibility. The all of us who are knit together by the Lord, all of us are interconnected. All of us is one strong body functioning well together with Jesus as the head and each part doing his and her share. Each part. That's Christ's plan. That's his desire. That's his instruction for the church. Each of us. What's happening at the end of verse 16 is to build up the body together. All of us serving, all of us edifying, not tearing down. Building up again, not tearing down. It's another thing in American culture we might want to, hey, let's build each other up. How about that? In Christ. Want to build each other up in love? Let's do that. <laughs> How serious does Christ take this whole building up? How serious is the Lord about his church? How serious does the Lord say, yeah, build up, don't tear down? How serious is that? Well, he's, he's very serious about it. I'll give you a couple of things that are kind of scary texts we don't talk about much. Titus 3.10. Paul said this, as for a person who stirs up division, because again, we're talking about whose church? Christ's Christ church. And we're called to do what to the church? Build it up, right? And we are all knit together, right? So anybody who is dividing and tearing down, listen to what Paul tells Titus. As for a person who stirs up division, and they're tearing down, after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with them. We have tolerated for far too long in the American church People who act up throwing spiritual tip, uh, temper tantrums, tearing the body up. We don't want to lose people who are afraid. Well, I don't want them to get upset. Well, you know what? That's also backwards. They're pitching a spiritual hissy fit and dividing the church. There needs to be a warning. This is the Lord's church. Nuh-uh. You're not going to be dividing it that way. Okay? But you do it in love. You might say, well, just one text. I don't, I don't know. I'll tell you a scarier text. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. Now, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 6. Paul refers to, the, uh, to us, our temple, our body, our physical body is a temple of the Lord. But here he's referring to the people of God. 1 Corinthians 3, 17. If anyone destroys God's temple, in other words, you, 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 you tear that thing down. You divide it, you, you mess it up. Instead of building it up, you, you, you jack it up, God will destroy him. Boom. That's strong. That's strong. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple, his word says. It's the Lord's church. He loves his church. And he says, here's my design. I've given you people whose job it is to equip you, the saints, so that each of you will do the ministry that you are called to do out of your spiritual gifts, which are not talents, but spiritual gifts, so that the whole body will be built up numerically and also in maturity, so that people will not be deceived, so that people will grow up into maturity, being self-feeding Christians, so that everybody who is interconnected together as one body can continue to build each other up in the Lord Jesus Christ, so building up and speaking the truth in love, so that we would be mature people 
people and Christ is head over all of it. That's the vision for his church. That's a church that will thrive no matter how dark the days get. Let's ask the Lord to help us be that kind of a church. We're going to have to unlearn, just like I had to unlearn a lot of things this past week. We're going to have to unlearn some things. And we're going to have to go back to some basics. Go back to some basics. Go back to the basics so that we can be the people that God has called us to be. Do the things he's called us to do. I got good news for you. Because some of you might be, again, thinking, wow, man, this is, I know that some email or something's going to come up and say, okay, now you've all heard, so everybody find a place to serve. Well, yes, I want to tell you, you I'm not, we're not sending that out, <laughs> but I need you to start praying now out of your spiritual gifts. And our people who work in our nominating team are praying, and, and we will be working to continue. What will it look like to make sure that everybody has a place to serve? Everybody should be serving, Okay. But here's good news. You're not called to serve everywhere. <laughs> That's another mistake we've gotten in America. Someone's serving in 25 different places because, well, no one else will do it, so I guess I'll do it too. And they're exhausted. <laughs> and they're running around, and you got all these other people who, are, who aren't doing anything. We should have this ministry. Well, would you be interested in helping out? No. <laughs> My role is to point out things that aren't there. <laughs> If that's your role, I'm going to say this in love. It's not a spiritual gift. Stop jacking up the church. Okay? Amen? Amen? All right. Let's pray. The invitation today is going to be a little bit different. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you want to learn more about what it means to follow him, uh, please feel free to come forward during our invitation, and we can set up a time to talk about that. If you have been wrestling with the claims of the gospel for some time, or whatever the case may be, or maybe the Holy Spirit has absolutely, <laughs> your eyes are open, now you understand, and you're ready to give your life to Christ, please, please come forward as we stand and sing, okay? And just say, yeah, I give my life to Jesus. I want him to be the Lord of my life, and we will set up a time to meet and pray and talk about that, all right? If you're looking for a church home and you believe this is where the Lord wants you to be, and you understand, yeah, I want to be a part of the people where I'm going to grow and equip, be equipped, and I'm going to serve uh, and plant myself here and be on mission with this group, then please come forward, and we'll set up a time to meet, too. Or maybe you just want to come up here and pray. Pray for yourself, pray for the church, pray for, for whatever. However you feel led, let us please continue to worship in our invitation. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, Father, that you have given us clear words, clear instructions in terms of how we are to, to do things and what we're called to do and who we're called to be and what the end vision is and what it's all supposed to look like and what we're supposed to be praying and striving towards. And Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to peel off those things culturally, perhaps, that have been building up for years and years and years in the church and our culture where we might see things solely through the lenses of Scripture. And Father, that we together in love would work together to become this kind of church, Father. Lord, I ask and pray that you would use this church for your glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.